We want to welcome you to this gathering of Mineral Springs Baptist Church. We are so glad that you are here today. We normally would ask you to fill out a connect card so that we could get to know you better, but in this trying time, we're gonna refrain from that. So please make sure to introduce yourself to myself, one of the greeters, let them know who you are, because we certainly want you to know that we are glad you are here at Mineral Springs today. I get to make the announcement about choir resuming Sunday at 4.30. 4.30 p.m. in the afternoon, choir rehearsal resumes. We're going to social distance. We're going to be in the sanctuary, and people are going to be spread out. And we're going to do this safely, but we want to practice to praise the Lord together. And we want you to come if you are interested in being in the choir. It's a good time for newcomers after this break. So God bless you, and hope to see you Sunday at 4.30. Hey Caleb, how did God give us the Bible? God gave him and he wanted to write down. Good job. Good job. Second <laughs> Peter one twenty one. But no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter one twenty one. Isn't it wonderful to hear what the children are learning, even in the youngest Kids for Truth class? I know it's encouraging to me, both as a mother and as one of the co-directors of the Kids for Truth program. We are gearing up to have Kids for Truth every Wednesday night from 6.30 to 8 p.m. starting Wednesday, August 26th. There will be a meeting for all Kids for Truth volunteers on August 19th at 6 p.m. and the prayer service will be at 7 p.m. If you have never helped with Kids for Truth and you feel led to volunteer this year, please see Courtney or myself. We would be happy to have you serve the Lord alongside us. Hello and welcome to this edition of Mineral Springs Online. Today we are going to be going through the Beatitudes of our Lord Jesus. This is really a review sermon over the last several sermons that we have seen through the Beatitudes. It's Matthew chapter 5 verses 2 through 12. If this is your first time being with us, I encourage you to review those older sermons, uh, as this will be a machine gun rapid fire approach to looking at the message of our Lord Jesus, the beginning really, of what I believe is the most important sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. It is beautiful. There is so much in it. As Christians, we don't want to just glance at the Bible but we want to dive into the Word of God. And so what we're doing today is to review on some of the highlights of this series, and I pray that it will be helpful for you in your spiritual walk and your relationship with the Lord Jesus. So let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Our Father, we come today in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the risen Savior, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord, I ask that you would use this time now to refine our thinking, to change our hearts and our minds for Jesus, that we might love you more, that we might follow you, Lord, with all that we have. Forgive our sins. Keep us in your care. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. So, Matthew chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 2 through 12. Listen to what God's Word says. Actually, verses 3 through 12, excuse me. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is our Lord Jesus speaking. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. 
blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then verses 11 to 12, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of things evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you have your Bibles, leave them in Matthew chapter 5. Go back to chapter 2, or excuse me, chapter 5, verse 2, because that's where we are going to be focusing now, verse 3 and following. Verse 2 lets us know that Jesus was teaching this message to his disciples, to all those who were listening. He went up on a mountain and he sat, and his disciples came to him, and he just began to teach this message. And these Beatitudes are so important for the Christian life, for us to understand that God has called us to be these things, but Jesus doesn't give these in a command. Rather, what he does, which he does a lot in the Scripture, is he tells us the reward that comes along with these attributes. He tells us and entices us to be these things because of the blessing he gives. The ultimate blessing that God gives his people is himself, his presence with us in heaven, in glory. And so our family lost a friend just today, and it was very sad news in one sense, but in other sense, another sense, it is a very peaceful thing, knowing that he is with Jesus, because he came to trust in Christ, to know him, to call upon him for salvation. He came to believe that Jesus Christ died for his sins, rose from the dead, and he was God Almighty. That was the hang-up for my friend that passed away, that for years he was taught that Jesus wasn't equal with God the Father. And so the words of Jesus were not perhaps as potent because they weren't the Word of God. And after doing some research and after many prayers going up for him, God worked in his heart, changed his heart, and he came to know the Lord. And actually... I talked to his son today, and his son told me he died hearing Bible preaching. He had it on Bible preaching when he passed away. And can you imagine, dear ones, uh, being in the presence of the Lord Jesus, as for a Christian, the door of death is paper thin, and going from going to sleep, opening your eyes, and there is your king, your master. What was the last thing you did before you left this earth? Well, I was listening to preaching. Of God's word. What, what, a, what an amazing testimony. Praise God for his salvation. Number one is this first beatitude, which is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What we're going to see is, I've hinted at this throughout this series, that these beatitudes are in some sense escalatory. They escalate as Christians mature. It takes this first piece, this first building block, if you will, to become poor in spirit, to realize you're bankrupt, spiritually speaking. You don't have money. You don't have what it takes. Only God can give us what we need. And if we understand that, we know what the Bible tells us here is that those who are poor in spirit, who know that they don't have what they need, they know that they don't have Jesus. They are blessed, and with that blessing comes great reward. The reward? Heaven as your home, to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. I want you to see Thomas Watson. And this is a long quote. If you want to get this quote down and you didn't have it from last time, you can pause the video. But he says, How poor are they? that think themselves rich. How rich are they that see themselves to be poor? I call it the jewel of poverty. Listen to this. For a man to become a fool, he may be wise. To save his life, 
by losing it. And to be made rich by being poor. Yet this poverty is to be strived for more than riches. Under these rags is hid cloth of gold, and out of this carcass comes honey. The picture here, of course, uh, referring to the Old Testament, but look at the, the, the way that Watson talks about this here, the, the stark contrast between going after riches and going after true riches, being poor in spirit, being humble. How do we do it? We said these four things. To own your own depravity. Do not pretend that you are righteous and of yourselves. Own it. Know it. Seek it. Know thyself. Okay? Know yourself. Secondly, then, after you know who you are, be in awe of the awesome holiness of God. God is completely, utterly, perfectly holy, and we are not holy. And we need to understand God's holiness demands a response from people. And once we see that, we want to repent of sin, and we want to lower ourselves in the presence of Almighty God, knowing that He loves us and cares for us. Thirdly, we talked about mourning our sin. There's going to be a lot of mourning. I've had friends who've lost loved ones, and it's so sad. And mourning is a natural thing when we encounter death. But I want to ask you, when's the last time you mourned over your sin? I had a couple of moments here recently where I just was in my heart, in my spirit, just upset at my past and about myself and about my sin. And God used that uh, to let me have a time to mourn and to grieve between the Lord and myself uh, of some of the, the ways I have been in the past. And the Lord is using that to show me how I can be uh, more poor in spirit. The fourth thing is that we do need to celebrate. Uh, we always need to celebrate and thank God and celebrate your sanctification. What do you mean by that, preacher? I mean that when God gives you a little victory in an area in your spiritual life, you need to celebrate it and thank the Lord and praise Him and acknowledge that. The devil wants us to feel like we'll never get anywhere spiritually. But what we want to do is acknowledge God's grace in our lives. Well, the second beatitude, which is the next step after we realize we are poor in spirit, then we mourn our sin, which is what we talked about in point number three, just in the last slide. Blessed are those who mourn. And here Jesus, I believe, staying on track, is speaking spiritually. Blessed are they who those who mourn what will happen, for they shall be comforted. They receive the comfort of their king when they mourn their sins. This causes us as Christians to be continual in repentance, to be continual in trusting God, in looking to Him, in following after Him. And another Watson quote, we'll have several of these, Though sin is pardoned, God has forgiven us in Christ if we've trusted in Him, still it rebels. We're still sinners, even though we're forgiven sinners. Though it be covered, it is not cured. It refers to Romans 7.23 where the Apostle Paul talks about he's not who he wants to be. Wretched man that I am, who's going to save me from this body of death? In other words, even as Christians, we say things, we do things, sometimes we think things. We don't want to think. And how do we, how do we resolve that? Well, we mourn our sin. We have to acknowledge it, mourn it, and celebrate when God gives us victory. He says, There is that in the best Christian which is contrary to God. There is that in him which deserves hell, and shall he not mourn? We should mourn, dear ones. We should mourn our sin before Almighty God. How do we do it? What should we look out for? Well, I have five truths here, things to do, action points. Avoid despair. Don't get into despair. If you're in despair, I don't believe you're where God wants you to be. Because as Christians, we know our sin, we mourn it, 
but we don't grow into despair. We also don't have a hypocrisy about us and say we're sorry and say we're sorry and say we're sorry and not do anything about it. And there's no change. That's a hypocritical uh, and an empty mourning. It's empty even if you really feel it when you mourn and you really feel sorry, but you don't take those steps or those actions and rely on the Holy Spirit to work in you to bring about change in your life, it, it, then that morning was meaningless really, wasn't it? Because it didn't do anything. Fourthly, um, we don't want to be show-offs for other people. There are some people who will do that. They'll just run themselves down. They're trying to get accolades or, or they're trying to get attention. And we don't want to do that as, as true Christians, as mourners of our sin. We want the comfort of Christ. And so, we don't want to mourn just because we got caught. We don't want to mourn just the punishment that we will receive. And so don't just mourn over punishment. Mourn over the fact that you are not how God has designed you to be. And because of this broken world in which we live, because of our flesh still being broken before God, and because of the temptations of the evil one, the devil, very often, very often, what we do, what I do, what you do, is we sin against God. And then that leads us to being upset, not wanting to face the consequences, and mourning that we got caught more than mourning our sin. The third beatitude, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. If the first beatitude deals with our relationship with God, being poor in spirit, this beatitude being meek is how we deal with one another in our horizontal relationships. The meek, Jesus says, inherit the earth. Not the wealthy, not the powerful, not the wise even, but the meek. Of course, if you are meek, you're going to be wise. And so what is meek? This is something that we want to make sure we understand. It is strength under control. Partly, it is being thick-skinned and not being easily offended. We live in a culture now that is so offended by every little thing, and it really needs to grow up and get over itself. And we need to do that as Christians. We need to not take so offense when the world is the world, when someone says something that hurts our feelings. We want to be like Christ. Thirdly, meekness is waiting on others, being patient, caring about others. That's the definition, I think, that's a good definition of understanding meekness. How do we get there? When you're talking with family, when you're talking with friends, when you're talking in the workplace, love the truth more than you love being right. In other words, love that which is true more than proving or showing yourself to know that which is true and which is right. Secondly, learn to be others-focused. What does the group need? What does everyone need? Consider others more important than yourselves, as the Scripture tells us to do. Thirdly, this is something the Lord's working on me about. Don't jump to conclusions. Don't immediately think that someone else is targeting you because of something that was said. Give others the benefit of the doubt. Don't jump to conclusions. And fourthly, you ain't perfect. You're not. I'm not. We're not. No one but the Lord Jesus was ever perfect on this earth. And be careful to remember that. That when you are doing something and you're offended by someone else, think about yourself in this way. Not, oh, how they hurt me. But think about yourself and saying, well, what did I do? What could I have done differently? Okay, I believe that's helpful. Richard Sibbs, now a different Puritan, said this, It's a good strife, a good battle amongst Christians. One to labor to give no offense, and the other to labor to take none. The best men are severe to themselves, tender over others. And that's how I want to be. I want to be more severe to myself 
so I can be better for Jesus, but more tender to others so that I can show myself to be meek and, and grow in meekness. I pray that's what you want as well. Our fourth beatitude the Lord Jesus gives us is Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Where the meek are promised the earth, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness' sake, after doing the right thing, after having the right heart, Jesus says they'll be satisfied. That hunger will be filled. Well, how do we get there? We outlined this process that, number one, we need to stop eating junk food. If you really want to love righteousness, don't fill yourself up with things that are not righteous. And so there are going to have to be some things you cut out of your diet to make room for righteousness and to build that appetite for heavenly things. We can be so easily distracted that we miss that which is most important. Secondly, start exercising. Spiritual exercise, reading God's Word, prayer, praying for others who have hurt you, praying for our country, praying for the opposite political party that you happen to support and those political figureheads. And then thirdly, spice up, kick it up a notch, right? Um, your spiritual life. As you would other things in life, what can you add to your spiritual disciplines so you don't get stuck in a rut and it doesn't become mundane and monotonous and out of rote ritual. God doesn't want us to be like that. He wants our hearts to be on fire for Him and for His glory. This brings us to our fifth beatitude where Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful. And what do they receive? They receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. How do we grow to be merciful with others? It takes work. It may take practice. Perhaps you grew up in a family where mercy was not very distributed, and you were held to a very strict standard, and it hurts, and you can still feel that sting, and maybe that's what causes you to be unmerciful. Maybe you don't know true mercy, and you grew up in a very permissive family, but there was never that loving correction, which is a form of mercy, upon your soul. Um, we talked various ways, but I want to emphasize to empathize. Empathize with those uh, to whom you are, are, are ministering to, and your family, your loved ones. Put yourself in their position. How would I feel? What would I want them to do? This is the golden rule. What would I want them to do if that was me? How would I want to be treated? Secondly, encourage them. We have so much discouragement in our world today, so many bad things going on. We all need encouragement. I need encouragement. You need encouragement. Find ways to encourage others. Thirdly, not only do we empathize with them, encourage them, but exhort them. Part of mercy is in correcting and admonishing those that we love. One of the most unloving things we can do as Christians, and I'll never forget uh, listening to the video from uh, Penn and Teller, and Penn sharing the experience he had with a Christian, and he, he's a, an atheist, maybe an agnostic now, I, I think more of an atheist, who gave him a track and a Bible and cared about his soul and didn't do it with, with anger and malice so that it affected him. And he said in a video once, how much do you have to hate somebody not to proselytize them, not to tell them, if you really believe there's a hell, if you really believe there's a heaven, it must be hate not to tell them about God. And so it's the same thing for Christians. It's actually mercy when we correct each other, when there's sin going on, when we build each other up through exhortation. So don't take it rashly when someone does that to you. See it as the hand of the Lord helping you and guiding you. Fourthly, entreat God for them. That means pray. That means go to the Lord on their behalf. 
the people that you want to be merciful to, and maybe you haven't been merciful, pray for them. I'm praying for my children more. I'm praying for my wife more. I'm praying for our church more because I want to be a merciful person. I'm praying for our country. I'm praying for those who uh, hold views that, that I know are not true. I know are not biblical and I know they're bad for America, but I, I want to be merciful and I pray you do too. Where do we learn this mercy? We talked about Stephen, but our Lord Jesus on the cross, Jesus looks down at these people and he looks up to the father and he says father forgive them for they know not what they do the ones who were mocking who had crucified the lord of lords he prays for their mercy and so should we number six blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. One of the biggest blessings that we see here after we have learned mercy, we've learned to hunger and thirst after righteousness, we want to change our appetite, we want to be like Jesus, we want to be merciful to people, we want to have a pure heart. We talked about this picture in our Sunday morning service live on campus. Maybe you didn't get to see it. It's three young boys writing uh, this uh, Carabao in the Philippines. And I had an opportunity to go to the Philippines with the Bob Tebow, Tebow Evangelistic Association years and years ago. It was a wonderful experience. And you would see these young children with these massive beasts of burden. And they would be able to direct it and to carry it around wherever they wanted to go. And they could do so simply because... There was a ring through the nose of this beast. And wherever they pulled that ring, that's where he'd go. A lot of Christians are living as though they have the ring of sin in their nose. Because they don't know Jesus has broken that ring and set us free. You don't have to sin. You're not bound to sin. Sin is a choice for a believer. Jesus has broken that, and God promises us the opportunity, the possibility of having a pure heart, so we should pursue it. A pure heart is sincere. It hates all sin, not just some favorite sins that we have, but all sins, and it wants complete purity before the Lord. How do we get there? I think if we look at James chapter 4 and verse 8, we get a wonderful picture that we pursue God while we stop our wrong actions and think about the things of the Lord and not double-mindedly, but single-mindedly. In other words, we're not wishy-washy and one day we follow Jesus and one day we give in to our temptations, but that we're consistent in Christ in what we do. James says, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Clean your hands of sin. That's stopping your sin. Draw near to God. That's the first step. God has not moved. We move. He doesn't. He is always there for His children. And He will draw near to us. Then we stop our actions that are wrong. With, and that's given the biblical picture of cleaning our hands. And we purify our hearts. We think rightly. He calls them double-minded who do not have pure hearts because they're not thinking properly about the Scripture, about God's Word. We submit to God's Word. We follow Him. One example of this is what we're going through right now in this pandemic um, is that we submit to God before we su submit to any government, right? Uh, the government has put impositions upon the churches that it hasn't put on other things we see, particularly in California, other places, what we need to see, what we need to realize is it's our submission is to the Lord. We think single-mindedly. God tells us to submit to the governing authorities as long as what they're telling us to do doesn't supersede what God has already told us to do. Number seven, blessed are 
the peacemakers. For they shall be called sons of God. I have two pictures for the, for the last couple here. This picture is a painting and it depicts Abigail and David. Uh, Abigail was a peacemaker. Her husband was not listening and was not helpful to King David. And David was angry. He was going to do the wrong thing. And he was going to go and just kill all the men and wipe them out. And he had the power to do it. But Ab Abigail interjected. She went, she brought gifts unto David. She begged his pardon. And guess what? God softened David's heart. He did not do the evil he had intended. In fact, later, God killed Abigail's husband. Then she married David, and there was peace, and there was prosperity because of that. What do we need to do as believers in being peacemakers? Because the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God, a relationship with God. We will get that inheritance if we are His children and we're peacemakers, prioritize peace. There are certain doctrines that we cannot negotiate on. The divinity of Christ, the plan of salvation, the Godhead, three in one. But there are a lot of other doctrines and areas where we can still have fellowship, even though we really disagree. And that's going on right now in our country with how a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ are dealing with this pandemic and dealing with the protests and the riots and the um, movement of Black Lives Matter. Um, of course, all black people are important to God, absolutely. Um, but this movement that is ungodly, that does not want people uh, to be families, they're against those things, then that's a total separate issue. But my point is this, to be peacemakers, we prioritize peace. And we say, brothers, we can have peace because we are in Christ. Sister, we can be in peace, even though we disagree about this. There used to be a time where Christians uh, and different political parties in America could do that. Secondly, we preserve peace. We fight to preserve peace. Most things are not worth fighting over. There are some very important things which are worth fighting over, but we preserve peace. And thirdly, we embrace God's peace. God tells us, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And he said through Paul in Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. As far as it depends on us, we want to have peace with everybody. And you, dear one, you embrace God's peace he gives us a peace that passes all understanding. He knows what you're going through right now. He knows what you're dealing with. And He loves you, and He cares for you, and He is there for you. Number eight, and this is our last major point. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the last, as we would say, official beatitude. And our Lord Jesus qualifies this one where he does not on the rest. He says in verse 11, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Then he tells us what to do. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We haven't talked much as the church about this reality as much as we should, but what is true? If you want to live for Christ and you're trying to live godly, you're going to encounter persecution because you're a Christian. 1 Timothy 3.12, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. We're seeing that today. We're seeing that today in our world. Those who are deceived, they're deceiving others, and they're, being, they're going from bad to worse. Um, but the good news is, God is in control. 
He's in charge. He sits on his throne. No one has taken it from him. And times like this have happened in years past in different countries and different histories. And the Lord, he will prevail and he will protect his people. Matthew 13, 21 tells us about how those who do not do that which God tells us to do under persecution, because they were never really saved in the first place. Um, and so I'll say this, never denounce Christ. Teach your children, teach your grandchildren, never denounce Jesus, no matter what. Never, ever is there an excuse for us to do this, dear ones. It would show that we're not true believers. Jesus gives the parable of the soils. And in talking about this soil, it fell on rocky ground. It sprouted up fast, but he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation, that's hard times, persecution arises on account of the word. So he believes God's word and then all of a sudden it gets difficult. Immediately he falls away. Well, that's horrible. That's horrible. That's what happens to some under persecution. Do not let it happen to you. Maybe right now you're not attending church because you're scared of this virus. And there is reason to be safe. Absolutely there is. But perhaps for you, the Lord is, has been working in your heart. And right now you know God's talking to you. And maybe it's time for you to return to a, a live worship setting. We'd still love to have you watch here, but, but God has called His people to come together um, and to do so safely, uh, to do so wisely, yes, but to do so. And so I just encourage you, depending on where you live and, and how you are able, maybe you are not able, some truly are not able to get out, but if you are, worship the Lord and worship with his people. And just like my friend who passed away while listening to preaching on television, um, if you contracted this virus at church, and I know we don't want this, but you know, when we get to heaven, all of these things aren't going to matter as much, right? Um, don't be afraid, dear ones. Be safe, be smart, be wise as serpents and as gentle as doves. The last verse I want you to see is to remind ourselves that those that we encounter that disagree with us, that fight against what we believe in, they are not our enemies ultimately. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of of evil in the heavenly places. We wrestle against the devil. We wrestle against the enemy of darkness. And I pray for you that you would look unto Jesus and not be afraid and trust in him and endure persecution for Jesus' name's sake. I want to close our time today and close this series on the Beatitudes by simply reading them together. Um, if you have an ESV Bible or if you have taken notes um, through this, I'm going to read it through the, the English Standard Version. And if you have it, whatever version you have, if you have your Bible with you, I'd like for you to get it out. And I'd like for you to, to read along with me. And if I say some words that are a little different than yours, then just continue to read yours. And let's try to read these verses together as we close. Matthew chapter 5, in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. And Jesus tells us, here's what we do. Rejoice and be glad. It's a sign. It's a seal. It's a promise. It shows that he is right, that he is true. For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Sorry, I interrupted there. I just got so excited. I want to explain that part of the scripture. I love you. I pray for you. I pray the Lord blesses you. And I want to close this time by praying together. Heavenly Father, my prayer now is for all of those who are tuning in. Lord God, that you would work in each heart, in my heart, in their heart, Lord, to make us more like these characteristics that our Lord Jesus, these attitudes that we are to be, that we would, Lord, strive to be poor in spirit, to mourn over our sin, to be meek, to hunger and thirst after righteousness, to be merciful, to be pure in heart, peacemakers for you and your namesake, and to endure persecution. Because when we do, our reward is in the kingdom. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We pray for those who are hurting and struggling, who have lost loved ones, those who are facing weather from this upcoming storm. And Lord, we, we know you are in control. We submit to you, Father. We praise you. Help us to be the men and women you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.